hope everybody is doing well today. Um, myself and Dr. Eileen Malm will be moderating this session. Uh, we have, um, I think, four participants that everybody is going to be really happy with and, and learn from today. So uh, on today's panel, uh, people are going to be introducing themselves here shortly, but uh, just wanted to go ahead and, and give people a heads up that today we're going to be hearing from uh, Captain Phil Kirk from Park City, Utah, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Kornman from Lakeville, Minnesota, Deputy Chief uh, Ridgeden from Colorado Springs, and Assistant Chief uh, Waterworth from Jonesboro, Arkansas. Uh, before we get started, though, um, uh, with some of the Q&A, uh, I was going to go ahead and have Dr. Eileen Malm will introduce herself, uh, the other four panelists, and then we will start our Q&A session. Uh, Eileen? Great. It's great to be here with everyone today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Eileen Malm, and I'm one of the Body Worn Camera TTA leads, but I'm also a professor of criminal justice at California State University, Long Beach. I've been working with sites implementing body worn cameras since 2015, and my work primarily in this area is in the um, evaluation field. Great. Captain Kirk? Uh, Phil Kirk with Park City Police Department. We're a small resort town in uh, Park City, Utah, obviously a ski resort town that hosts the uh, Sundance Film Festival every year. Great. Chief Kornman? Yeah, with the Lakeville, Minnesota Police Department. And for those of you not familiar with Lakeville, we are the Minneapolis, St. Paul metropolitan area. We'd be the, right now, the southernmost uh, suburb. We're one of those explosive growth suburbs. Uh, our population in about 1996 was 34,000. This year, we ex expect to exceed 70,000. We're one of the uh, top, in fact, usually the top building permit cities in Minnesota. We're 62 sworn, 10 CSOs, 25 reserve volunteers, all utilizing our body worn camera pro program. Great. Chief Rigdon. Hello, everybody. My name is Pat Rigdon. I'm a deputy chief with the Colorado Springs Police Department. Uh, we're a city of about 500,000 people. We have 750 sworn officers, and we've been uh, participating or doing body cameras since approximately 2016 and have about 550 cameras deployed. Great, and then Chief Waterworth. I am Lynn Waterworth. I'm Assistant Chief with the Jonesboro, Arkansas Police Department. We're a city of about just over 70,000 in northeast northeast corner of Arkansas. We've got just over 200 employees with 169 sworn. We've got 200 body cameras deployed, just both to our sworn officers and some of our civilian capacity folks, as well as our reserve. Great, great. Why don't we go ahead and start off with Captain Kirk. Will you please provide a brief description of your agency and its body-worn camera program? Well, we're a smaller agency, like I indicated in the ski resort town. We host uh, the 2002 uh, Winter Olympics, but we have a lot of influx of uh, people, about 40,000 um, guests during uh, peak special events, but we normally have only a population of about 8,000, and we have about uh, 32 sworn officers and then 10 to 15 part-time uh, reserve officers. Great. Chief Corman? Yeah, the city of Lakeville, um, backing up a little bit about our body-worn camera program, we were actually late to the game in our in-car program. We did not go with in-car until about 2014. One of our neighboring agencies to the north, if anybody's familiar with the Burnsville, Minnesota Police Department, they are one of the first in the nation to go with Axon. So we've been watching the body-worn camera programs with a, a great amount of um, interest. And when we went on with... Um, in car, we went with another with a different vendor, and uh, that vendor didn't work out so well. When we made the move to go with a different in car system in our budgeting process, we also applied for a grant and received the body worn camera grant. Uh, we applied for that and received that grant in 18, and we were able to roll out our body worn camera program after uh, in the state of Minnesota you were required to do a community notification process and end that with a, uh, with a hearing. Anyway, that took until approximately um, the end of 2019 to do all those things. And we rolled out our 
our first bodywork cameras hit the road in about August with full deployment in November of 2019. Along with that, we went with a in-car camera system that utilizes triggers with our body worn cameras, and we've had those out there. So, um, so far it's been a, a good pr process and uh, a, a very, actually a very interesting part in the state of Minnesota, like I said, dealing with the hearings and the public notification part of it uh, was a, we learned a lot in that process. Great, great. Chief Rigdon. Yeah, as I mentioned, we have a department of approximately 750 sworn and with 550 cameras out. Those are almost exclusively on uniform personnel at this time. Uh, we began our deployment in 2016. We were one of the cities that was a grant recipient with about 500 cameras. Uh, we did that as a phased in approach, starting slowly with about 60 cameras and then expanded over nine months. So it was about mid-2017 or so when we had the 500 out, we've, we've since expanded to um, 550. In the next couple of years, uh, legislation here in Colorado now requires all sworn personnel to wear a camera. So we will um, have to get the additional 250 or so out. And so we've got some growing to do as well. Great. Chief Waterworth. A little bit more on ours. We our body worn camera program we started a little bit earlier on just kind of trial and error and and did a TE with probably about, about 10 different vendors and everything and through that we 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 also went with axon because of their their free trial that was for about a year and during that process while we were evaluating that that last vendor we also applied for the the grant received the grant in 28 late 2018 we got fully launched and so we've been rocking and rolling with ours for a little over a year now we have 200 cameras all together and we're also starting to incorporate starting last year and then some slowly as we go i guess you might say we're putting in some more in-car cameras that we're replacing our old vendor with the axon so that it's all compatible Can I maybe share a little bit about, I didn't say much about our camera program in Park City, if I could. Um, we actually started in, uh, we had body, or excuse me, in-car cameras for many, many years, but in 2013, we decided to go all in with body-worn cameras and purchase enough for their entire department that year uh, from some funds from our uh, equipment budget, but also for a local uh, grant that we had. We found that uh, very short after time after that, that we needed to integrate our both camera systems from the in-car and the body-worn camera. And so we applied for a grant back in 2018. We're successful through uh, BJA to get the grant money to do that. And that's helped us tremendously in not only incorporating those two and, and integrating them, but uh, getting the latest technology. Thank you. Great, thank you to everybody. And it's nice to have such a nice mix of departments and experiences here too. So thank you for coming. Uh, you've talked a little bit about your program's status and where you've come from, but can you talk to us more about your current status and some of the major milestones that you've accomplished? And I'm gonna switch up the direction a little bit. Let's start with Chief Waterworth. For us, I think as far as milestones, obviously receiving the grant just put us way ahead of where we would have been otherwise. It, this is sort of an industrial hub, a medical hub for Northeast Arkansas. And so our, our we get, I'm not gonna say a lot of tax revenue, but we get uh, some tax revenue that would help with things. But when you start trying to incorporate something this massive into just a normal budget, having that, that push forward by receiving the grant really helped us a lot. We were able to go from just focusing on having maybe 15 or 20 cameras to suddenly we could operate with everyone having a camera. And so for us, the one of the huge, I don't know, I don't know if you want to call it milestones, but a big, huge stepping stone was receiving that grant so that we could go with full deployment right away. Great, thank you so much. Um, could we go to Chief Rigdon now, please? Uh, sure, I, I think um, most agencies will say that probably the big milestones are getting to that um, point where you can fully deploy 
uh, and that and that was a big one for us too. Um, however, every little step during this is is a great uh, achievement from getting the pilot out to you know finally um, getting to full deployment. Um, I'll, I'll share a good one with uh, everyone just to kind of capture the magnitude of how much data these generate is earlier in the summer, um, just after you know roughly four years, not even quite four years of deployment, we captured our one millionth video. So uh, that, that was a big one for us. It, um, it actually shows the acceptance, I think, of our department and that officers are using it, using it on a daily basis. That one millionth video really puts into scope, doesn't it? Just the magnitude of these programs. Um, could we now go to Captain Kirk, please? Sure. Um, I want to say that you know, the evidentiary value we found has been terrific for our, especially for our legal department in prosecuting cases. But we've also found that it reduced it our reduced the number of uh, complaints against officers, uh, assaults against officers, and it was great for providing uh, outreach to our community and uh, in our theme of community policing, which most departments have. Uh, I say one of the things that we found early on is that uh, there's a lot of hidden costs and challenges there, and we ended up developing a technical specialist position to help uh, because we found that it was so overwhelming for our first line supervisors reviewing all these videos, making copies for the attorneys. So we developed this technical specialist position, which is a non sworn position that's been a tremendous help. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Chief Cornman, please. Uh, some of our major milestones, I think, first of all, as they discussed, the, uh, our community meetings. Actually, we went out and met with as many organized groups that we can find that were already in existence. We tried not to create just a body-worn camera meeting. We went out and we met with our Rotary Club, our Lions Club, school district. We worked a lot with our school district to um, reach specialized groups. All in all, we held about 26 informational meetings and uh, sought input on our policy and also educated the public on what we were going to be doing with body-worn cameras and tried to uh, make sure they were educated. Uh, one of the end results with that was we actually established, some, we had good relationships, we established some even better or new relationships with other groups who were doing those meetings. So that was a, it was a major milestone, a major accomplish, accomplish, accomplishment with that. The other thing, uh, one of our main goals when we moved over from body-worn cameras, or to body-worn camera program was, one of our major goal, milestones or major uh, goals was to have a system that the reliability was uh, significantly improved over our current in-car system. Uh, to sum it up is we needed a win. We needed technology that worked. So we used this program and used receiving this grant as a reason to upgrade things like our in-car routers, our in-car computers. I believe last year before implementation, we replaced almost every piece of technology in our squad cars. And with that, we now have a system, both in-car computer and uh, all the camera systems, both body-worn and in-car, that function with near, nearly 100% reliability. Uh, and that really was what we, when we listened to our officers, they wanted dependability. And so one of our evaluation tools that we're looking at is what is the reliability standpoint? And from that, our selection was, we have uh, we've done a really good job of um, increasing that reliability. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. So uh, starting off with Captain Kirk, um, can you talk a little bit about the implementation challenges to your body-worn camera program, as well as how, um, how you would have done things perhaps differently if you would have known this ahead of time? If you're okay with it, um, my co-host is Captain Latham. He did the operations end of it and implementation. So if it's okay, can he share that perspective? Of course. Yeah, thank you, Captain. So, as Captain Kirk mentioned, we had uh, we had a um, a digital in car system <clears throat> that we had been using, and then when we implemented body worn cameras in 2013, the two systems were not compatible at all. And um, we had a range of different in car cameras. We Park City had actually been using in car cameras since back when they were VHS, and so we still had a few of those hanging around. Even um, we uh, with with the grant have been able to uh, go with the same exact company and have all, now have every uh, single car in our fleet um, equipped with a 
um, a digital in-car camera uh, that syncs to the body camera, uh, wirelessly downloads when the officers come into the station. And one of the things we were seeing when we had two different systems was that uh, officers were having to spend uh, too much time off the street, off their beat and back in the office and categorizing video. And, um, you know, it was really like uh, spent the last half an hour of their shift having to do that. And so with, with the new technology and syncing up the systems, they're able to categorize things in the field. Um, it, the system captures everything and uploads it to the server. We, we did choose to go with an on-site server rather than a cloud server. But um, I think going with the two separate companies in the beginning was probably, um, although we were trying to be very progressive and, and be, we were the first uh, agency in Utah to have every, every single officer equipped with a body camera. Um, it set us back a little bit that we, that we didn't have the, uh, the same system with our in-car cameras. Great. Chief Cornman. Um, our implement, implementation challenge has been in the following. Our, obviously, in Minnesota, weather becomes a major issue, and clothing, not a major thing, but getting mounting hardware for our body worn cameras for every exterior garment you could have on in a single day. You might uh, wear up to three garments, and depending on what call you're on, whatever. So, we continue to work through things. Um, Mounting, mounting issues with our, they're not really issues, it's just actually making sure everybody gets a, um, a clip or a holder for every external garment. Other simple things, if, you're, if you have external vests like our agency does, making sure your external vests, the shirt underneath and uh, like I said, the jacket will have a, a place to hold the camera. Uh, finally, our other one that we continue to work on is using the in-car trigger to start the body worn camera. Right now we're evaluating, is that really the best way for us to go? Simply when you look at the muscle memory, similar that you would that you would uh, try to teach through defensive tactics or, or out on the range, all of those things require significant amounts of practice and, and uh, repetition. When you don't actually have the officer start the body worn camera and the squad car does it for them, if they uh, are in, a, in an event where the squad car actually doesn't start the camera, we've had a few uh, failure to starts where the officer didn't have to utilize the press of the body worn camera. So we're actually talking about eliminating the in car triggers and um, seeing if we can continue to work on that muscle memory to get those cameras on. So we are uh, the last one that we continue to work on is when officers, I call it fudging on camera starts, when they follow our policy. At the time of dispatch, they should activate that camera. Things like 911 hangups uh, for day shift, you know, right out of the right out of the gate in the morning, you have a lot of false alarms. We're finding that officers are reluctant to start their cameras because then they have to close them out, and uh, we're dealing with some of those small issues. So those have been our biggest challenges. Thank you for that, uh, Deputy Chief Rigdon. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> we had we had a lot of logistical challenges trying to put that many cameras out, but. I think um, early on, um, our biggest challenge, and I, I don't mean to bash IT people, they just think in, of things in different terms. Certainly, um, network security is a big one. So overcoming um, the ability for our IT folks to work with our vendor to open up um, our network to their traffic and to have that all work seamlessly was, was a big challenge. Um, it, frankly was overcome with a lot of communication um a lot of you know there was give and take on both sides but um i think the communication was key and, and we ended up implementing just week as we were implementing the program having a weekly um team meetings with the vendor rit and our folks all in the same room talking about the issues and how to work through those um we actually had hired a project manager for all of our um, just department projects um, that person was ended up being key to the success of the program. I will tell you, our vendor at first, I think, got caught off guard about the magnitude of this project. And so I think they learned a lot of project management along the way. But I, I really couldn't uh, stress enough the importance of, of proper project management and the ability to coordinate all of the entities involved in uh, deploying a camera system as you roll it out. Thank you. Uh, Chief Waterworth. 
I can hear from the uh, comments that uh, Deputy Chief Ridgeton made that sounded like they had a lot of the same things we did. You don't want to talk trash about the IT folks, but they were some of the hardest ones to kind of to get on board with where we wanted to go, what we wanted to be able to do uh, with some of those things. And it was getting them in a room. And for us, we our IT people do not work for the police department. They work for the city. And so that was a, a new little wrinkle because every time we would ask for something, it seemed like they wanted to send a different one. And we're like, no, you, we got to have the same ones because we can't keep having the conversations over and over. But once we got through those first few hurdles with that and kind of got everybody on board and rocking and rolling past that, it was the, the hurdles or challenges came with the officers. So it's, it's a new habit. They've got to get into the habit of, of starting that camera and everything. And we backed up and did, you know, retrained and, and reviewed our policy, revised our policy a little bit. We went, we don't have in-car triggers. We actually have the officers trigger them themselves. And so we went from, you know, turn it on when you think it needs to be on to turn it on when you're dispatched to something or turn it on as soon as you're getting out of the car or on something. Because there have been a few times that officers have, have activated their cameras to record something that they thought was going to be kind of an innocuous situation or whatever. And it turned into something that we were certainly very glad that, that they had video of what went on past that. There, we had a few challenges with training our deputy prosecutor's offices and getting them on board and, and kind of just used to the whole thought process. It's, it's that whole, someone told me one time, there's two things officers hate. They hate change. And they hate it when things don't change. And so you've always got that change hurdle to, to get over. And so once everybody got past the whole, well, I don't want everybody watching what I'm doing. It really was fairly smooth sailing for us from, from that point forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you all again. I have one last question and then we're going to move to the audience questions and there's some great ones in there. Can you all discuss some positive impacts that body worn cameras have had on your agencies and or also in the community? And we'll start with, let's go right back to Chief Waterworth. Uh, for us, we, we sought out community buy-in from the beginning. We wanted to talk about the fact that we were going to implement body worn cameras and that we were looking at researching different body worn cameras. And then we we also wanted to make that presentation to our city council and also had like a public meeting. If there's anybody's got anything to say, we want to know it now. We don't want to be, you know, two, $3 million into this thing. And then someone decide that they had a problem with whatever. And so we felt like we got a lot of good community support from the beginning. And then for us, we really started to see the value of these body worn cameras, just a very short time period into it. We had a couple of officer involved shootings. Uh, we tried to, it's, it's kind of a balancing act, but we tried to be ahead of the game and go ahead and put those videos out there as soon as, it, as we were able to. We did that with our own sort of narrative as this is what's happening now. This is what's happening now. This is, you know, this is what this officer is encountering or seeing and, and kind of provide a little bit of guidance rather than just throw it out there like somebody's Facebook live video stream or something, provide a little guidance to go with what was going on. And so situations that, that could have been bad, I think turned out better. Also when the, the recently this year, when we had a lot of protests and things, there, there were, I say a lot, it's very, let me, let me rephrase that because there's, uh, I know folks from Minnesota that are well aware of how protests can really go. We did have a few protests earlier this year and had a complaint as a result of one of those protests. You know, this officer shoved this lady down and, and all this stuff by going immediately to those, those body worn camera videos, we were able to show, no, that's not what happened at all. Actually, he's the one who got knocked down and bumped into her. And so it, it's made a lot of difference for us. We felt like that where the public may have really had something negative to say and wanted to try to make something out of something that really wasn't anything, we were able to quickly counter and say, no, let us show you what, what actually happened from the officer's perspective. We had a, the body worn camera TTA had a webinar a couple of weeks ago dealing with body worn cameras and protests. And we heard a lot of the same story. So thank you. Um, Chief Rigdon, please. Yeah, sure. Um, 
I, I, there's been a lot of positive impact, um, and some of them are very similar to uh, what Chief Waterworth said. But um, I, I would say the, as time has gone on, the officer buy-in has been uh, outstanding, um, in, in particular because nine times out of ten, the cameras are going to back the officer up and show that what they did is the correct way to do things. Um, we've actually, uh, one thing that's been popular with our officers is that <clears throat> on uh, complaints, on the dispositions of complaints, um, you know, with either sustained, unfounded, not sustained, we, we actually have a cleared by body worn camera category now to where if we can quickly um, look at the body worn camera, show that the um, misconduct did not occur as stated, we can clear that complaint out um, way, way faster than we would have been able to in years past. So I, I think that's a big plus for us. Uh, similar to what she was saying, we've had, um, well, we certainly had one very controversial shooting that actually had some um, uh, household camera footage that it, had you just been able to see that, um, it was very damning to the officers. And uh, by looking at the body worn camera, it showed a full picture of what was actually transpired, ultimately cleared the officers um, certainly uh, segments of the uh, populace were not still happy with the outcome, but it, it, um, it played a key and pivotal role in the uh, district attorney's decision on what to do with the officers. So overall, um, I don't think you'd find too many officers in our department that would um, say, let's get rid of these things at this point. Right, thank you. Chief Corman. Uh, some of our accomplishments, I've already gone over a couple of times, but the, um, when we were out seeking input, one of the things we found is that many of the members of the public, when we said we were actually seeking body-worn cameras, nearly every meeting as well, the response I got was, well, we thought you already had them. So when people learned that we didn't have them, we immediately gained the support of the public for bringing them forward. The, I think the easy part for us, we've, we've had some, needless to say, understatement of the day will be, we've had some controversial incidents put on in the state of Minnesota. So um, our officers were waiting for them. They wanted the body worn cameras. And so those, that's been the easy part for us. Uh, some of the things that we're seeing is, is the ability to use the body worn cameras for, uh, for the resolution of citizen complaints. And um, from a positive side, we're seeing what we already what we already knew is our suspicious suspicions were confirmed is that we have a whole lot of good police work going on out there and that we have a uh, very professional staff. We get to see that and we can show people when they come in to complain. Um, we've had many instances where people have alleged things and when we show them the video and ask them to point out what they were explaining to us before the video was played, those complaints pretty much go away. So um, I mean, as I already pointed out, we did utilize this as an opportunity to really push forward our technology and uh, the grant that grant was a good seed money to show people that if we're going to make this investment it needs to work and again, that was a big push to, to get equipment that works so it's been very good for all of us thank you and captain kirk sure and in addition to the other panelists uh, benefits that they mentioned the one big one for us i think is we have a citizens uh, complaint review board and they've been more and more reliant on seeing the video to really tell them what happened. And it helps them make the, the proper decision and uh, a better decision uh, because of that you know, benefit of that actual camera footage. So I think that was our number one benefit. Well, thank you all for um, um, answering those questions. And we're gonna go ahead and start the Q&A uh, section from the uh, um, audience. Uh, we're going to start off with a question to the panel from the Indianapolis Police Department. And the question is, wonder how many of these agencies allow officers to review their recordings prior to completing a report uh, um, or providing a statement for administrative purposes? Um, Captain Kirk, can we just go ahead and start with uh, you on this question? Yeah, we tackled that early on. We decided to allow them to do that because we found it was very beneficial to them to be able to uh, get more detail in the report, more accuracy. And so we've allowed them from the get-go to be able to do that. Chief Corman? We, um, to develop that part of our policy, we actually also utilized our critical incident policy. We put language there, worked with our psychologists as, as well as several others. And 
not result of any pressures from any group or individuals or otherwise. It was a lot of it through our psychologists and some, some others. We decided that uh, officers are not allowed to view their body worn camera for critical incidents. And those are involving either whether it be a motor vehicle accident, et cetera, that results in death or great bodily harm to the, to the victim. And other than that, for your, I would say your administrative, your standard things that the officer is able to view the video for report creation, except what involves critical incidents. So um, we worked, we worked uh, a lot with our unions on that. We, we are a union state, and that took a lot of, um, a lot of work up front to uh, explain our rationale for doing that. And that's where our, some of our other programs that we have in place, like our, like I said, our department consultant psychologist helped us uh, send through that message that watching the video wasn't necessarily in the best interest of the officer before writing the report. Fantastic. Uh, Chief Rigdon. Yeah, fairly uh, similar that um, we've gone with a little bit of a hybrid approach in that normal routine day-to-day -day situations, uh, even including, you know, most uses of force we allow the officer and any other officer that was on the call to watch their video or the other officers on the scene's video to make sure that they were recording accurate remarks in the reports. Um, where it gets a little tricky is uh, deadly force situations. Um, we initially had it written in our policy that, uh, that the video could only be watched after an initial statement is made and then uh, basically we let the officer watch the video and then clarify anything that was missing. That still holds true many times, but we found quickly that um, when attorneys get involved, certainly the officer might have an attorney and then the, um, the investigating agency, that it becomes a little bit more of a negotiation of when that actually occurs. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit more fluid than that. Um, but for the most part, we do allow um, general viewing of the videos. Thank you. Uh, Chief Waterworth. Uh, it sounds like uh, our our procedure and policy and everything is probably very similar to Colorado Springs. We, for the most part, we do allow them to review the video prior to any report creation or anything like that. We would it would depend. I guess it'd be sort of a case by case basis as far as if it, if it were a deadly force situation as to you know, do you allow the officer to, to view it right away? I think it's going to depend on the content of the video and stuff like that. We've been fortunate. We haven't run across that just yet, but also once the attorneys get involved, it, it, it changes things. There's, there's also, there's a need to be consistent. And one of the things that, that our legal representation pointed out is that you want that officer's statement to be consistent all the way across the board. So you, there's a hesitation to say, well, just let them kind of say what they, they thought without any viewing of the video at some point in time, those, those things have to coincide. You don't, you don't want what they said to be terribly different from, from the video, yet you do want that sort of, you know, untainted thought process, what, what was going through their mind at the time. So we've, we've kind of been having to do that on a case by case base, basis on anything that was extremely critical, but for the most part on daily things, they're viewing them before they write a report or anything. Thank you all. And just to pick up on this question, the body worn camera TTA team does a policy analysis every year. And so far we've reviewed 304 policies. And in that policy review, it shows that, not, and this is of all the departments that have gotten um, BJA funding like yourselves. It shows that 95% of departments allow routine review of officers. And then for critical incidents, it's about 90% uh, can review, officers can review before making a statement. So very much aligned with our panelists today. If you wanna see, if you wanna take a look at the, that policy review, it's on the Body Worn Camera TTA website. All right, our next question comes from the Lee's Summit Police Department. For our panelists, how big of an increase did your agency see in open record requests once your agencies moved to body-worn camera programs? And I'm going to start with Chief Rigdon, please. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I was a little surprised initially the uh, request didn't start flooding in, but as time has gone on, uh, they have increased uh, fairly steadily. 
we've we've uh, believe it or not been able to manage our records release of body worn camera footage with just two people, um, and that has to do with something we, I think we're I saw one of the questions we may talk about in a little bit with the DA and all, but um, the open records request stuff really from general citizens just wanting to know what happened has almost been uh, nothing very minimal. Most of our requests come from attorneys. Um, you know, we have a we have an attorney up and down the front range of Colorado here that deals in personal injury, and so we get a request from his agency or his uh, firm on almost all traffic accidents that they have uh, had some interaction with. And you know, that's even with body worn camera. Uh, we weren't there; we didn't see what actually happened in the accident. But all the statements of drivers afterwards, we'll get those requests. So it's um, it's definitely become a lot more frequent than it was initially in our rollout. Thank you. Can we go to Captain Kirk next? Yeah, we were worried too that we're going to get bombarded with these, but we fortunately have not, I guess. And uh, I'm especially concerned about the news media because I am a public information officer, but we haven't had that many. Uh, one of the real concerns we have there too is the redaction of those videos. That takes a lot more time and, and technology to do that. But again, we've been fortunate we haven't had too many of those yet, and, but um, we're kind of holding our breath on that one. All right. Thank you. And Chief Waterworth. We had probably a 20% increase in just overall FOI requests. It took a little bit for everybody to kind of get used to it, but they did certainly get used to it. We're probably getting at least one a day on average for some sort of video. Uh, the city also has a series of intersection cameras that we're also responsible for answering those FOI requests on. And so we've added in a few things like that. So those those are probably about as prevalent as the body worn camera because when you start talking about an accident or something like that, they're more relevant. The, someone mentioned redaction. For us, that was a big factor in why we chose the vendor we did because of the software that they've got and its redaction capabilities. Arkansas has a very liberal FOIA law and just about everything is accessible to the public. And so we wanted to be able to respond to those requests in a timely manner and redaction was a big deal for us. All right, thank you. And Chief Kornman. Minnesota has a pretty restrictive law regarding who can obtain the video, unless you're in it, unless you're a subject, um, you're, it's considered private. So for us, we've seen a very, very small increase in requests for any of that data simply because most people know it's very, or those that would come in and ask just know you're not likely to receive it. So ours has been minimal, minimal impact in that particular area. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Um, next question is from Dan Spitzarney. Uh, what was the effect on citizen complaints after implementation of body-worn cameras? Uh, Captain Kirk. As I mentioned before, for us, the, there was a significant reduction in complaints against officers uh, and also assaults against officers after we implemented our body-worn camera program. So very happy in both of those. Great. Chief Kornman? We haven't seen an increase or decrease in the complaints. The resolution is significantly faster. Um, again, it's, it's very, just about every complaint we've had has been uh, very easily resolved by reviewing the video and determining if the alleged conduct occurred or not. And uh, as we're seeing generally, the, the results of the are, are generally very, very favorable to the officer. Chief Rigdon. Yeah, similarly, uh, I don't think our um, numbers necessarily went up or down on complaints. Um, however, resolution, I think, has, has definitely been impacted by speaking it up, I mentioned before that we have a actual category cleared by body worn camera for the complaint process, which um, handles, I, I would say probably 30% uh, of all of our uh, internal affairs complaints get cleared by that method. So it's, um, it's really had a positive impact on us in that regard. Great, thank you. Chief Waterworth. We also didn't see a measurable increase or decrease it is making a huge difference though in the whole outcome and, and how quickly you get those those things resolved. I do like the cleared by body worn camera. That's something that we have not previously considered here. I think we're, we're gonna steal that idea. 
Uh, I know in uh, Phoenix, we've repeatedly found that um, the implementation of body-worn cameras had a, had a substantial impact on the reduction of, of complaints. There's also been quite a bit of work. Um, uh, Dr. White, uh, who works on this project, and you'll be hearing more from him later, he's been keeping a pretty close track on these issues. And, and, and from what he's found, um, one of the more robust findings has been um, the implementation of body-worn cameras has resulted in a reduction in complaints, um, uh, regardless of which community that it's been implemented in. Um, great question, Eileen. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, in so in, in fact, 20 of 26 studies that have been conducted in, on body-worn cameras across, uh, really across the Western world, show a reduction in complaints at a statistical or close to statistical level, which is pretty significant. It's it's pretty overwhelming when we talk about social science research. All right, the next question is coming from the Pennsylvania Chiefs of Police. And it's a good one too, uh, really timely. Any problems with DAs or defense attorneys or public defenders in their discovery and going through hours of video? Have you had complaints? Have you had to have discussions? Have there been sort of budget concerns surrounding this? Let's start with Chief Corman. Uh, to give you an idea, we budget approximately $220,000 a year for prosecution, again, uh, with an agency of 62 sworn when we instituted our body-worn camera program, our, this is one of the things we didn't think about our prosecutor, our city attorney that we do by contracts and looking at an approximately $50,000 a year increase. And there were a lot of eyebrows raised saying why. And the prosecutor reminded us that I cannot fast forward through a video. I have to watch the entire thing. Maybe there's something said. There's a detail in there that if it's played in court, it would be detrimental to the agency or to the case. So I do need to watch that all. And uh, after that, again, we, we put that into our budget. It went through, but um, that's just a, one of those little details. Or in some, for some budgets, that'd be a big detail um, that people need to be aware of that uh, the prosecutors do need to review, or at least ours indicates that he does need to review that video if it's going to go to trial. So it did have an impact. Thank you. Chief Waterworth. There was a little bit initially a little pushback from prosecutors who they were like, this is taking forever. You know, everybody there had to turn on their camera and we're having to watch all of this. And I think it, it was more of a learning curve than anything. And kind of once they got accustomed to the benefit that they could derive by watching the, the camera video it just it goes beyond what a an investigator or an officer can type into the narrative of a report and again the vendor that we use and the software that we use as far as the discovery and things like that it's made it super simple as a matter of fact the prosecutor's office really loves it because they can just create a file and then they share just that file so just those videos it's not like you're sharing access to every video you have but just those videos pertinent to that case are then shared with the, the defense and it's made their life easier. No more burning disks or having to hunt up a, a jump drive or an external hard drive or something like that and make copies. And so once everybody kind of got the swing of it going and got the hang of it, they've really, really um, liked it. Great, thank you. And Captain Kirk and Captain Leatham from Park City, I know through our discussions, you've had some interesting sort of challenges and then resolutions in this area. Yeah, uh, this is Captain Latham. I'll take that one. Um, we, we have initially, uh, because we have been using body-worn cameras back to 2013, we had that initial pushback from the prosecutors as well. Um, and we also found that we were spending lots of hours, uh, as Captain Kirk mentioned, we had our first line supervisors making DVDs. This, it seems like the dark ages now, but, um, and we would have to make them for prosecutors for defense. And so we're spending a lot more of our money and time in doing this. Um, what we have now, I think, is really the opposite effect where um, a lot of our prosecutors, if we don't have a video, they don't want to prosecute the case. So, but we have streamlined the system in that we send cloud share links of the video to the prosecutor and then they, they in turn can go ahead and send it out to the defense. So the, the, the process has been really streamlined and 
as I said, it's almost that if you don't have the video, now the prosecutor is not interested in the case. So it went from one way all the way to the other. Yeah, and we've seen that in other sites as well, and the research is supporting that statement that the lack of body more cameras is um, creating, creating a relu reluctance for um, prosecutors to go forward with the case. Uh, Chief Rigdon. Yeah, I would um, actually say this is one of the big successes for us, and I think the reason why is we got DAs and public defender's office and private attorneys involved in our um, transition to body worn cameras early on. Um, we're the largest agency in our area and the second largest also went with the same vendors we did. So we, we actually trained all of our DAs, public defenders and private attorneys um, to use our system. And then they get an account that uh, they can view the videos that are shared with them. So it's really cut down on process time. Um, I, w I will tell folks that one thing I have seen is that um, private defense attorneys in particular have a lower caseload, obviously, than uh, like our district attorneys, and they watch the videos very carefully and, and watch them thoroughly, whereas many times the district attorneys, I think, don't have that time. And occasionally that has caught um, not only our officers, but the, the uh, district attorney's office off guard a little bit. So um, once you have it, it's, it's a great tool and it can show good things, but um, with the lack of time and ability to watch those videos, it can be problematic as well. But overall, a, a very much a success. We continue to have monthly training sessions that are available to any new uh, attorneys that come on any, any of the staffs locally, and we train and get them an account. So it's, it's continued to roll. All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so next question from uh, Pinsakan, uh New Jersey Police Department. Um, how did you find your ability to upload the videos initially? Did you have to substantially increase your internet speed? Uh, Captain Kirk. I think Captain Latham might be best on that one again, please. Perfect. Yeah, no problem. Um, actually, the answer to that one is no for us. So we, we have a um, we have a very good, robust IT department. It's not, it's not help it's not it doesn't sit within the police department like one of the other chiefs mentioned it's a city it department but um park city fortunately had the infrastructure already so we didn't really experience um any of those kind of issues we did experience some issues with uh what chief rigdon talked about earlier is that our it uh, had so much network security that it was uh, problematic during the installation and at uh it took a lot longer to work through than what we, we thought it should have. But um, as far as network speeds and things, no, we, we never had that problem. Uh, Chief Cornman. When we had our in-car system that uh, we stored locally, we had already observed some issues with our uh, internet speed and internet capabilities. So we had already taken the time to upgrade our system. Our police department servers also are a backup system for our city hall servers in that same um, physical building. So we use it as our backup site. So we, we did have to correct that, but we corrected it before uh, we rolled out our body work camera system. Thank you, Chief Rigdon. Yeah, we, we actually ended up um, having all body worn camera traffic put on its own um, network switch type thing. So it's, we, we have to pay extra obviously for it to, uh, for the service we provide. But um, it, um, I, I think without that, it would have definitely impacted our overall network functionality in the city and, and the uh, one, I guess, switch and everything that we had working for us would not have uh, held it. So we had to go to extra capability. Thank you, Chief Waterloo. We also had in-car cameras in, in our vehicles and had kind of worked through that, I guess you might say, along the way where we had added additional download points and, and things like that to so that we could offload that video quicker onto our servers. And so we kind of had already approached that, that issue or tackled that issue previously. So we didn't have to do anything significant as far as our, our internet capabilities or anything like that. Perfect, thanks. All right, uh, this question is coming from the Federal Programs Director in Yabacoa, Puerto Rico. 
was there any issues regarding officers not willing to use the body worn cameras? Let's start with Chief Rigdon. Um, additionally, there was absolutely reluctance in my opinion. Um, and so I, I think this is again where a, a pilot, a uh, smaller pilot group of officers was beneficial to us because it really doesn't take long for uh, some event of significance to be captured on camera that might have otherwise resulted in a complaint and a drawn out investigation. Um, and once those are resolved quickly by body camera and they um, support the officer's actions, it, it quickly started to gain acceptance and other officers started to see the benefits that can come about from wearing BWC. So um, it, it's just a little bit a matter of time. I think there's always gonna be a little hesitation of Big Brother watching. I think the other key to that though is also policy. We were fairly restrictive in our policy of when supervisors could watch video and what they could watch it for. I think a big thing that we wanted to avoid was um, kind of little head hunting expeditions. And um, so we've been fairly careful of trying to avoid that. All right, thank you. Uh, Captain Kirk or Captain Leatham. Um, yeah, I would say that uh, initially with our first rollout of the body cam system, there was, uh, you know, just the, the fear of the unknown. I think somebody mentioned earlier, officers don't like change, but, um, but overall we've had really good success with our um, compliance with our body camera program. I think that um, the officers see the value in how quickly complaints are being cleared and how maybe they spend less time in court because of the video. And so um, I would say now that we've had our second iteration of a body cam system that we have uh, um, excellent compliance at this point. And, you know, we really don't see that as a problem. I think that sometimes the officers uh, will get in, you know, a mindset of, well, hey, I'm going out to the front parking lot of the police department to do a VIN inspection and they don't activate their camera and then that escalates into something else. And so um, our policies do address, you know, any type of law enforcement function that the camera needs to be activated. But if we have any um, problem, it's that. I don't think we really have a reluctance of our officers using the cameras because they see the value. All right, thank you. Chief Waterworth. As I said earlier, there was some initial hesitation, just worried about, as the captain said, kind of worried about the unknown as much as anything. But as things have moved forward and they've seen the value of it, I think that the officers really have appreciated the, how valuable it is to them. It's kind of a thing that we had, we've noticed all along especially in talking to citizen groups and things like this, we, we, we know we have officers doing really good things all day long. And it just kind of helped reiterate that and help, help, help bring that point home as the citizen, different citizens or different media outlets or something like that got hold of some of our body worn camera video. They're like, Oh my gosh, you're, you're, you were telling the truth all along. The guys were doing the right thing. And it makes it, it, it pumps the guys up and, and gals and, and makes them, makes them feel more appreciated when the body worn camera video that's used that hey used to show that hey they are doing a good job all day every day thank you uh chief corman um the willingness was always there i think if uh, we don't have any willingness it's it's as described earlier it's simply because we've got a few folks that want to get around i don't want to i don't want to have to categorize or lie out of the camera system for a false alarm the other one we've had to fight, uh, I think like most law enforcement agencies, is that maybe the misperceptions or the rumor mill that an admin can actually log on and watch what you're doing all day long. It's, no, we can't do that, nor do we have the time, nor do we have the desire. And again, uh, working, with, um, working with our folks, making sure that they trust that what we're using those cameras for. Again, uh, putting in policy is one of the other panelists already said, avoiding the headhunting, making sure you write in there that uh, you just can't use the system to go out and find the specific behaviors you're looking for in uh, certain employees. And uh, that's built a lot of trust with the officers. And again, uh, they still see that they want them and they want them out there and they want to use them. Great. Um, this question is from Aurora, Colorado. Um, 
thoughts on cameras coming off during physical altercations? Is this just the nature of the business? What are your opinions on the realities? Uh, it became a huge issue for a critical incident we experienced. Uh, Captain Kirk, really? Um, I'll take that one. We uh, we have experienced that. Uh, we have a we have a old uh, main street that has a fairly substantial row of bars, and so we we, we have a uh, we have bar fights regularly, and it's pretty much that every weekend we will have a camera come off. Um, we've experimented with different types of mounts, with the really heavy duty magnetic mounts inside the shirt. Um, different things. Unfortunately, what usually happens is the, they'll come off on one officer and we have another officer with another angle, but it, it is a problem. It continues to be a problem. I don't know. This is one I, I have no idea what the solution is other than it just as these um, working with the vendors and working with your um, officers, because sometimes they have the best ideas of the best way to mount these things. We've gone to an exterior vest uh with the with the webbing on the front which has seemed to improve the problem but um yeah it's a problem that's regular for us chief corman we too have gone with the uh, molly mounted some of the molly mounts on the front of our exterior vest those are helping um that is part of the reason that we selected and opted to continue to go with in-car cameras some agencies have chosen to move away from in-car camera but we view that as just another just another piece of equipment and give you the broad overview in case that other camera does fall off, become incapacitated. Uh, what we also see is occasionally during physical altercations, the camera is actually obscured just due to the close proximity. So, um, but we do view it as, we do understand it's just one of those things that believe that is gonna happen. It's the nature of the beast. Great. Um, Chief Rigdon. Yeah, the, uh, the product that we went with uh, was from Utility and it has the internal kind of shirt mount where it shoots out a little grommet. Um, however, like other agencies, we're starting to transition to uh, load bearing vests. So we were going with the Molly carrier as well, which so far seems okay. Um, I, I will say a lot of products nowadays have various ways to turn them on and off. Our product initially um, was getting turned off by getting whacked too hard during a fight or physical altercation. So I would just caution people to make sure your settings are correct that maybe it can be turned on by, you know, either tapping the camera or bumping it, but maybe it has to be turned off in a different manner. Something that um, we had several critical incidents that uh, where the cameras just got bumped and turned off completely. So uh, something to watch for. Great. Chief Waterworth. I think in the right situation, any of them are going to come loose. We had one come loose in a, a large incident we had, and uh, we're actually able to track it inside of someone's pocket for a little while and just finally just deactivated it. But that's the only camera that we've completely lost. And so we've gone also to the, the Molly carriers and, and that's made a huge difference. And as our vendor has worked on their end of it, the, the mounts have become better. And so I think we have less problem now than we did even as recently as 18 months ago. And so I think that that's a thing that'll get better over time. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. We have two questions that are linked and they're to do with activation compliance. So uh, the first one from, our, from the Aurora PD, under what circumstances do you allow officers to turn off their cameras during calls for service? Is it supervisor approval first or are they define or are there defined situations in your policy? And then the question that kind of comes after that that maybe you can attend to as well is from the Roanoke PD. What do you do to ensure compliance with your body worn camera policy on activation and usage of cameras? So two big questions. Let's start with Chief Rigdon. Uh, sure, so we, we initially started uh, back in 2016 with a lot more officer discretion. Uh, since that time, we've ratcheted down to where officers are required to turn the body-worn camera on on any uh, official business that they're on. So uh, essentially, they don't have to turn it on in administrative conversation with supervisors or um, uh, going into the store to buy something, those kind of things. But other than that, generally, if it's a, a um, any kind of official 
contact that we require to be on. Um, we had initially had a mute function on our device that we were, um, officers really liked the ability to mute because then they had discussions about probable cause, what actions they were going to take on a call. Um, frankly, I think we're going to do away with that as well. We started to scale that back based on some um, police reform legislation that we had passed that I think we'd rather overcome those conversations in court than have those missed and have questions about what was said during that period of time. So um, I think it's policy driven though, uh, for the most part. And then quite frankly, I think it's on supervisors um, to ensure that folks are in compliance with that. All right, thank you, Chief Brigden. Let's go to either Captain Kirk or Captain Latham. Yeah, so uh, the state of Utah makes it a little easier for us in that they, there is a state statute that says when the camera can be turned on and off. That there are a few, um, a few exceptions for the camera, uh, for the officer to be able to turn off the camera during an incident. One of those is to confer with a supervisor as long as the situation is stabilized. The other one um, is interesting in that we, we um, started doing lethality assessment protocols um, and safety planning with victims in domestic violence, sexual assault calls. And um, we found initially that the, the law didn't allow us the, for the officer to turn off the camera and it was recording some very sensitive information from the victim regarding safety planning. So um, our, our policy and our state statute allows for us to be able to turn the camera off in, in, in those circumstances. And then just like Chief Rigdon said, we don't allow, we don't have to have our officers turn the camera on with everything they're doing. It has to be some sort of official contact or law enforcement function. Great, thank you so much. Chief Waterworth. I think our policy falls pretty much with everyone else's is that we want the officers to turn the camera on pretty much when they're having any sort of official contact with, with any member of the public. And then as far as turning them off, along with turning them off for certain conversations with a supervisor or something like that, we also allow them to turn them off if you're going into a private residence and that resident has expressed that they don't want you to have the camera on, we will afford them the opportunity to turn it off at least for that initial part of the con contact to kind of protect that privacy. Same thing, we had to have a conversation with our local hospitals. They were extremely concerned about what might be recorded as the officers went into the hospital. And so there are certain situations where we don't want them to just leave the camera on and running unless there is a situation that's ongoing that requires it. We do Having said that, though, we also tell them that if something happens and the situation uh, escalates or ramps up and they need to turn the camera back on for their own protection and to record what's going on, they can do so. But we also, at the same time, try to balance out that initial concern for privacy from private residents and the hospitals and things like that. Also, when it comes to compliance, I, I will say, for my agency anyway, I felt I attended the National Body Worn Camera Conference last year and learned so much about compliance from people who were actually, you know, involved in it and had learned different little tips and tricks and things like that. And we just have a regular schedule that a supervisor is going to look at X amount of videos from different situations, either call driven or officer driven encounters and they're checking for things like policy compliance and things like that and the officers are used to it and we don't really get any pushback no one's ever expressed a concern that that a supervisor might be out to get them or anything like that what we have found in at least one instance though is that we had an officer that was just despite repeated warnings and additional training and everything we just couldn't seem to correct some officer safety big issues that uh, and behavior that really not only put his life at, at, at risk but other people as well and we actually had to take action concerning that so the compliance is important uh, for that aspect and we we try to stick to a, a regular schedule on that thank you uh chief corman one of the things we do are a quarterly audit supervisors your direct reports you need to audit um it's small but it's five videos per officer per quarter um 
try not to cherry pick short ones, but um, try to pick them at random. And uh, sometimes that may mean some, some long footage for the supervisor to watch. So that's, um, that's helped us in the compliance. As far as turning them on, turning them off, again, because Minnesota's law is fairly protective of, uh, of the individual's rights that's in the video, we encourage officers to basically run the cameras from beginning to end, regardless of the incident. We do have some variation in our policy that if a person simply won't give a statement where you're talking about a neighborhood issue where it'd be pretty clear where the information came from, we do allow the officers to turn off the um, turn off their iron cameras in that particular instance. But again, we do uh, we do stre stress that um, it's our belief that uh, if we're going to have them, the best the best way to utilize them is to have them on. And uh, most officers. We've had very, very little pushback on that from the officers. They agree that uh, having all of their interaction recorded has been the most benefit thus far. Thank you. So next question from uh, Roanoke City is, what access do your internal affairs personnel have to the video? Um, Chief Kirk, or Captain Kirk, uh, or Latham? We provide them uh, full access to that and all the supervisors too. So. Um, we felt that that from the very beginning was the best way to go. Uh, I think that's, yeah. Are there, po are there policies or procedures that sort of direct them when, or are they permitted to uh, take some discretion? Uh, I don't recall us having any action, any policy on that. Did Kevin Lathan? No, our, our policy doesn't address it. We, I mean, we, we are a small agency. So when you're talking about internal affairs staff for us, you're talking about a lieutenant. So um, he, he has access to it, just like our first line supervisors do, um, uh, and could, could look at any incident, um, administrator rights to the, to the video program. Great. Pete Cornman. And we, um, ours are, our ability to review the, in, by, uh, I would say we don't really have internal affairs again being 62 sworn we do have one lieutenant that handles all of our internal affairs but we did sprinkle that in i'd say through our um, critical incident policy our complaint process all of those things it addresses that regardless of the agency's size so our supervisors are able to review that video almost immediately for complaints that come in and they're encouraged to do so handle those incidents that they can if they do see something that rises to the level of an official complaint that we need to investigate further, then it does move on to our internal affairs lieutenant and, uh, and is dealt with in that manner. So we do allow up and down, all the way up and down the organization review of those incidents. Thank you. Chief Brigman. Uh, we've limited the internal affairs staff to only watching videos that are associated with a uh, case or investigation that they're assigned just to avoid, again, kind of the um, uh, over or you know officers feeling like there's too much oversight or they're kind of doing the head hunting with them, so they're they're limited. Chief Waterworth, we don't tell the internal affairs necessarily that they can or it has to be related to what's going on. Generally, there's enough for them to do that that's all they're going to view pretty much anyway or videos that are related to uh, something they might be working but we also don't limit the supervisors like i said when we do the compliance they have a certain amount of compliance checks that they have to do but if they see something that's concerning we don't limit them from continuing on and viewing additional videos or, or something like that if they feel the need to thank you all right, this next question we, we've addressed a little bit, but the back end of the question we definitely haven't yet. What is your organizational policy for allowing the general public to view footage upon request, but then what is the turnaround time and what is the determining factor for how quickly the video is released? This has been in the media a lot lately, so I'll be interested in your responses. Start with Chief Rigdon. Well, it, it's kind of a tough question. Um, so our, our devices actually have the ability to do playback right on the device itself, so you can watch it right away. Um, we've uh, prohibited that from officers just showing the video to whoever uh, on scene. Um, if we do get the open records request from whomever to get it, um, we consult with a city attorney, uh, weigh the citizen's 
you know, right to have the video versus um, our right to keep that private. You know, that it's called a Harris test. Um, and so we kind of handled those on an individual basis. Uh, and we try to make sure we're just not making arbitrary decisions. All right, thank you. Uh, Captain Kirk or Captain Latham. I, I think with us, it's a similar process to any re records uh, report request. Uh, maybe a little more scrutiny from the legal office to make sure that there aren't any uh, privacy issues in addition to the regular reports. But very similar to where we handle the uh, cover, we call it the Grandma Act, uh, cover government records uh, uh, management act. And so very similar to that process. And but there is some more scrutiny by the legal department. Thank you. Uh, Chief Waterworth. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Arkansas has one of the most liberal FOIA laws, I think that I've, I've ever run across. And so for us, we're given three days to respond. And we try to be as efficient as we can and not drag it out. If we're going to give it out, we're, we're going to give it out. The only exception for us is if it's part of an active investigation into some sort of an ongoing case. For the most part, even though we may think, oh, uh, you know, this, their motivation for why they want it is not anything we can question. And so we have to go ahead and, and release it to the public. Thank you. And Chief Corman. Ross Rube, um, releasing the public would be, again, covered under state law. And because it is so restrictive, unless the person is in it, they're most likely not going to be allowed to see it. And um, unless, for example, in the middle of the night, you're investigating a case or a daytime, it doesn't matter. The officer could play back that footage or for, for some reason, if they had something on their body worn camera that may aid in an investigation that may be shown and that is addressed in our policy. And we have tried to educate officers on when, that, when that's out there. But uh, as a rule, um, officers are not really permitted to play video for the public, even though we have that ability. As far as our administrative services staff, they try to turn those re records requests around as quickly as possible. But similar to our city attorney, they don't send anything out without viewing the entire video from beginning to end. The fear that we may have someone appear on a video that uh, if their image gets out, we would have significant issues with that video being released. So again, it can take that can take some time, but um, as far as turnaround time, our law provides as long as we are diligently and actively working on it, we it takes the time that it takes. Um, but we've had fairly good luck in getting them turned around and getting them and getting those needs met and those requests met as quickly as possible. Thank you. A uh, question from Brooks Park PD. What kind or amount of time is spent on administrating the collective videos? Um, in other words, review, media requests, public requests, long-term storage, purging. Um, thank you. Chief Kirk or Latham? Uh, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, <clears throat> initially, you know, as I, I've said this a few times, initially it was cumbersome on the department. Um, We've worked it out over the years to uh, where it, it has a, has a lot less of an impact on um, our first line supervisors in our administration. It has a bigger impact on our civilian employees, on our record staff, and then we actually went out and created a position that we didn't have previously uh, when we implemented body worn cameras, which was a uh, police technical specialist. And these are civilians uh, who are are trained to in redaction and in locating video to prepare it for um, to share the files with the prosecution. So um, it takes a significant amount of time. However, we wanted to make sure that we weren't spending a significant amount of time having our officers or our supervisors do it and not have them be able to out out doing their job. And so um, we actually had to go out and create civilian um, new civilian positions and luckily we had a uh, supportive city government that allowed us to do that so um you, you can't even as a small agency you can't really take it lightly once you implement one of these programs there's a lot of administrative work and the and time that goes into this great uh chief Cornman. we actually hired one additional administrative services person to add to the ability but along with that we've attempted to at least cross-train our entire staff, you know, 
I realize again, we're a small agency. So we want, we don't want any one uh, job duty to rely on any one person's legal education, they're sick, whatever the case may be that uh, we aren't able to fulfill those, those duties. So we train all our administrative personnel, our administrative staff personnel or our records division personnel in action, especially the data privacy laws regarding the release of the video. So we can get those things out and uh, as quickly as possible. We've also empowered a, um, one sergeant, one patrol officer, another we want some specialty positions that deal with our body worn camera program, specifically related to equipment at the administrative level, um, being that uh, we want it very close to the, to the ground troops or to the to field personnel, they can go to a sergeant or even this patrol officer to get their um, equipment serviced. If we have any equipment issues, we can get it returned and get it repaired and get it back in the officer's hands. And uh, it makes it a little more 24 seven, less communication by email or just, some, just something showing up in your mail slot or sitting on your desk and you're not sure what's wrong. So, um, but I would say probably uh, there is significant amounts of time spent. When I say significant, at least one of, one of our administrative services personnel, our records division staff is uh, probably working on some form of body on camera. And if you combine it with a review, whether it be a complaint or equipment or, or uh, dealing with some of our equipment issues, uh, it does require some empowerment and training of certain individuals to make sure those needs are met. Thanks, Chief. Uh, Chief Rigdon. Yeah, we've, um, so we've, we ended up adding two full-time uh, employees to manage the redactions and the sharing of videos, the fulfillment of the outside requests. I know that our district attorney's office, who's our, probably our primary customer, had to add two staff as well. I, I think we're both probably at the limit of those people. So as we add cameras, I think we're gonna have to add additional personnel as well. Um, and frankly, I'm, I'm rather amazed that they handle the number of requests and all the redactions that they do with just two of them uh, from our standpoint. Um, our PIO office, though, when, they, when we have a significant event, they get the, um, the raw video. They'll generally proactively prepare that video with either statements, narratives, and put it out. Um, so they handle some of that, but really it's done with two folks. Great. Thank you. Uh, Chief Waterman. We haven't added anyone full-time yet. We did add a part-time person to our evidence area because we view this as a form of evidence. And so some of the requests for videos is handled through our evidence section. Some of the other requests are handled through our public information office. And so we've been able to kind of split up the duties, if you will. And so no one person is tasked with everything, but as we add in some we have some neighborhood cameras that are situated in about 12 different places around town. We've added on some interview or some, well, we have interview cameras and then we've added on intersection cameras with the body worn and the in car. Uh, we're going to, we will be forced to soon add another person just to handle all of that stuff. Thank you all so much. So we have one last question. It's sort of a follow up from our downstream criminal justice actors and it's from the uh, Pennsylvania Chiefs of Police. And it was just a statement that they read an article on attorney's review from the public defender's perspective about the time and extra expense to them. Um, I was a co-author on that article. So if you have any questions, you can direct it, you can send me an email. My email is in the program. But basically what they were saying is that they're positive about body-worn camera footage, it's just, a lot often in the budgets, the extra time needed to review isn't included with for public defenders. I'm going to open this up to the panel. I'm not going to call on anyone. Has anyone had any specific uh, communication about extra time or any other concerns from the public defender's office? This is ours. It's primarily from our own prosecution. Uh, both, both our at our city prosecutor and our uh, county prosecutor express the amount of time it takes just to review all that footage. So I would assume that applies to the uh, defense as well. If, if they don't look at it, they may miss something. So I would see it being a valid, a valid point. 
our our prosecutors also kind of talked about the fact that it was taking more time to to prepare cases as they had so many videos to watch and I did hear from them that they were hearing similar hurdles coming out of the public defender's office but all that stuff seems to have subsided so I don't know if they've kind of just worked it out or learned to live with it or figured out something different but I haven't heard of them of either office having to put on uh, additional staff because of the time that's involved in reviewing the video. All right, Dr. Katz, I think we are at the end of the session. It's always my favorite session of this entire meeting. Well, thank you very much, panelists. Uh, I think uh, that will about do it for today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, Eileen, did you have anything else you wanted to say? No, just once again, thank you uh, for the audience members, anyone that's interested in those policy related questions, please do check out the policy analysis that the Body Worn Camera TTA team puts out that could get you an idea of what the majority of our or sort of how the different departments that have been given BJA funding break down in their different policy issues. And we also present that data based on agency size. So you can see, you can locate yourself as a small, medium-sized or large-sized department and see what other departments like you are doing in terms of policy. But thank you so much. Our panelists have been fantastic as always. Thank you.